Caesar is one of the great what-ifs of history. A great general, dictator of Rome, most powerful person in the Mediterranean and perhaps even the world. Yet, mere days before a planned expedition east was scheduled to take place, he was murdered by a group of disgruntled elites. The death of Caesar would send shockwaves across Rome, causing not just one, but two civil wars, by the end of which Augustus entrenched his position as the first emperor of Rome. Yet, what might Rome have looked like if Caesar survived? The idea of Caesar not being assassinated isn't a crazy one. Like mentioned, he was killed only days before leaving Rome, which would ensure his safety. Even accidentally, the assassination could easily be avoided. In fact, Caesar had been warned multiple times about the assassination, even being warned specifically about the Ides of March, the date of his assassination. If Caesar, quite simply, decided to listen to these advices and be more careful in these final days, the assassins would simply have failed and Caesar would have survived. Still, it does somewhat matter how the assassination is prevented. If it is stopped at the last moment, with blade-drawn senators around Caesar, the aftermath may be bloody, as Caesar punishes the people he deems responsible. But even in this extreme case, I doubt that Caesar would delay his expedition by more than maybe a couple of weeks. Enough time to ensure his authority over Rome is restored. More likely though, the assassins simply get cold feet. Or the plot is revealed to Caesar or his close allies and dealt with in secret. If either of those happen, Caesar can simply go and campaign as planned. The plot itself was rather big, with more than 60 senators involved, and like mentioned, there are plenty of opportunities for Caesar to catch wind of it. This more subtle timeline is the one we're going with. So, Rome is secured, and Caesar can go and campaign, scheduled to be gone from the city for three years. His first target would be the Dacian Kingdom. They have been causing trouble for the entire Balkan region, and besides, they were very rich in gold. Caesar, with his extensive experience in Gaul, will likely have little issue with securing Dacia. Besides, in our timeline, the Dacian king was assassinated right before the campaign was set to start. If Caesar is facing a divided Dacia, his campaign is even easier. Within, at most, around a year, all Dacian lords are either forced to ally with Rome or fully conquered by Caesar. Surrounding regions in Illyria and such are likely also expanded either during or after the Dacian campaign. All in all, Caesar likely spent a little more than a year campaigning in the Balkans. This is important for several reasons. First, like mentioned, Caesar was only planning to be gone for three years. Secondly, Caesar was already 55 years old at the start of this campaign and was never known for his great health. Another 8-year-old campaign like the Gallic Wars would probably be too much for his health. Third, and perhaps most importantly, the longer Caesar is away from Rome, the more likely it is that his opposition weakens his control. If Caesar stays away for too long, Rome will continue to descend into chaos. But we're not quite there yet. For now, Caesar's first enemy is defeated, yet the second one is far, far greater. About a decade ago, Roman general and Caesar's ally Crassus went on campaign against Parthia. He lost his entire legion, his life, and the eagle standard of his legion. All in all, a very big humiliation for Rome, which Caesar wanted to avenge. Yet, there is a lot of debate as to what Caesar wanted to accomplish. Suetonius is our first source, arguing that Caesar's main goal was subduing Dacia which has already been checked off, and the attack against Parthia would be relatively minor, inflicting moderate defeats on the Parthians, thereby restoring Rome's honor, and then go home again. The other version of events though comes from Plutarch, who describes a slightly more extreme plan. Of course, Caesar would first subdue Dacia, and then he would go on to fully conquer the Parthians. From here, he would circle up north to defeat the Scythians, this is already a quite ambitious campaign, but we're not done. Caesar, supposedly, then starts marching west again, 
in order to subjugate all of Germania as well, before finally returning to friendly territory. Now, I can tell you one thing for certain, this campaign is definitely not happening, if it even was a real plan at all. Caesar will very likely die of stress and old age during the Parthian or Scythian campaigns. But if he doesn't, then definitely in Germania. It shouldn't be understated how difficult these tribal and nomadic regions would be to fully subdue. The Gallic Wars of our timeline already took 8 years. Germania alone is larger, more populated and more forested. So Plutarch's plan definitely doesn't happen in full, but even in terms of general ambitions, Suetonius's version is far more convincing to me. Like mentioned, the campaign was scheduled to take three years. A full conquest of Parthia would already likely take longer, let alone Scythia or Germania. The conquest of Dacia was key for stability in the Balkans with relatively little risk for Caesar. But the Roman legions had an inherent disadvantage against the Parthian horse archers, especially around the lowlands of Mesopotamia. Caesar likely threats carefully, realizing the potency of his enemies, securing several victories and perhaps even threatening a more decisive push over the Zagros mountains, but then negotiations would begin. Caesar would secure a serious expansion of Roman influence over the border states, as well as moderate expansion into Mesopotamia. Combine this with Parthian war operations and the return of Crassus's banners, and Caesar has achieved the victory he so desired. I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. To keep up to date with all the videos I release, consider doing so. Thank you. Now you may wonder, why would Caesar pull back after having such an advantage over Parthia? Well, it is quite likely that during this campaign, Rome is increasingly chaotic as Caesar's opposition finally attempts to make a move. Specifically, Sextus Pompey may have started a similar naval campaign as he did in our own timeline, taking control over the seas and preventing grain from reaching Italia. By this time, Rome was far from food secure and with shipments from Egypt, North Africa and Sicily halted, the unrest in the city is becoming even worse. So, if Caesar wants to, he absolutely can continue against Parthia. And with enough time and effort, I'm sure he would have succeeded militarily. But by the time he is successful, Rome itself may have become a shell of its former self. So, for these reasons, Caesar likely cuts his Parthian campaign short and comes back to Rome as a war hero again, reasserting his authority and ending the chaos in Rome again. From here, Caesar takes on Sextus Pompey, defeating him, securing grain shipments for Rome again, and all in all, returning to Rome more popular than ever before. As a small side note, Sextus Pompey is likely pardoned by Caesar, as Caesar usually forgave his enemies. This might become important later. By this point though, while Caesar would probably want to go on further campaigns to Germania or Parthia, he is really getting old and needs to think about securing the empire rather than expanding it. We already know who is likely to be Caesar's chosen successor, Octavian, the later Augustus. He was set to accompany Caesar into Dacia and Parthia and was adopted by the dictator in his will. During these years in campaign and after, Caesar likely starts to groom Octavian for this role. Counterintuitively, this may actually be a bad thing for the future of Caesar's dynasty. Because in our timeline, Octavian learned a lot from the assassination of Caesar and the civil war that followed it. Octavian especially had learned that even if you have absolute power, if you flaunt it around and humiliate everyone, things might end up badly for you. Augustus never had a crown. He wasn't a king and the title of emperor didn't really exist either. After the civil war, Augustus at least pretended to respect the return to republican rule. It just so happened that within that republic, Augustus held a bunch of important titles, got personal control over a bunch of provinces and held command over the vast majority of Rome's legions. Yet, at least on paper, the senate and republican rule was restored and respected. This status quo the senate learned to mostly accept. 
and Augustus didn't meet the same fate as Caesar. So, the big question is, does Octavian learn the same lessons without Caesar's assassination, instead being raised for the position by the far brasher Caesar? After Caesar's great campaigns, Octavian is likely placed as the governor of Cisalpine Gaul. This allows him to get crucial governing experience while being close enough to Rome in case anything goes wrong. During this governorship, Octavian likely prepares the region for full integration into Italia, an important political goal for Caesar. Meanwhile, Caesar diverts his attention to reorganizing the East. Most of it was ruled by client kings with dubious loyalty, and even the provinces were newly conquered with dubious rule. In our timeline, Mark Anthony solved this by consolidating Roman control over Anatolia, but giving the borderlands to Cleopatra's children as client states. While highly unpopular in Rome, it wasn't actually a bad plan to improve the defenses of the eastern territories. Caesar, in this timeline, is still close to Cleopatra. In fact, so close that he had a son with her, who was said to become the next Egyptian pharaoh. In this alternate timeline, it is quite likely that Caesar considers Cleopatra's Egypt a pseudo part of Rome already. A similar reform of the eastern territories into loyal client states is quite possible. Politically then, Caesar would attempt to do the same as Augustus had in our timeline, collecting more and more power into hereditary and secure titles under his control, cementing his influence over Rome. But where Augustus' main title had become princeps, meaning first citizen, Caesar would likely reinforce his title of dictator perpetuo, eternal dictator. I think we can all agree which of the two titles is more subtle and less controversial. As Caesar eventually gives this title over to Octavian, the entire tone of the rule of the Caesarians is heavily shifted. The facade of the Republic is kept up in a far weaker way, as the old Roman institutions are basically just kept around for all time's sake. During these years, especially the Dacian campaign may prove more important than you realize. Caesar was already extremely rich, but he has now also taken personal control over the gold mines of the region. Caesar now uses his wealth to build great public works, spread propaganda, buying off opposition, rewarding allies, and perhaps most importantly, keeping the population of Rome happy with gifts and grants. Much to the annoyance of the other elites, Caesar's greatness in the eyes of the general population only grows and grows. With all of this in place, Caesar already adopts Octavian while alive, and legislation is passed to give him all of Caesar's titles, including that of Dictator Perpetuo. When exactly Caesar dies is difficult to say, but let's say he becomes around 65. Octavian inherits the new de facto empire from his adoptive father and immediately faces far more opposition than Caesar did, as the other elites are prone to test the strength of the new leader. Obviously, the Republicans would be amongst Octavian's enemies, but even former Caesarian allies like Mark Anthony having their own ambitions might also weaken Octavian's rule. Still, Octavian was the far better politician from all of these figures, with the sole exception of Cicero, but he would be around 72 by this point, and likely unable to effectively lead an opposition. Combine this with Caesar's blessing, the loyalty of the legions, and his great personal wealth, and it seems like Octavian's power is quite secure. From here, Egypt and Rome likely have a falling out, as Octavian sees them as a threat to his power. Not just because of Cleopatra's cunning, but also because of Caesar's biological son. Even in this timeline, if the opposition weaponizes Caesar's biological son against Octavian, this may become extremely dangerous. Adding to this, this is a perfect opportunity for Octavian to score some military victories independent of Caesar, proving his own capabilities as the leader of Rome. Finally, Caesar's land reorganization in the East is an uncharacteristically unpopular reform of his. Bringing them back under more solid Roman control will be very popular. So, this war is the make or break for Octavian's reign, as his opponents prepare to take advantage. 
For example, Sextus Pompey, who Caesar pardoned for his revolt, might try the exact same thing as before and starts taking control over the seas. It is possible that certain governors and higher-ups, like Brutus and Cassius, try to launch a full-scale civil war. Octavian's great test has begun. Yet, while undoubtedly costly, Octavian has top-tier general Agrippa on his side, and aside from all the previously mentioned advantages he holds, his opposition isn't even unified in the slightest. Divide and conquer tactics will likely win the day. One by one, Octavian and Agrippa manage to knock out opponents and consolidate control over the entire empire, eventually conquering Egypt too, leaving Octavian the undisputed master of the Mediterranean. By this point, Octavian might get a cool title like Augustus, and the fall of the Roman Republic is permanent. The dictator Perpetuo is here to stay. During his reign, Augustus likely still starts expanding the boundaries of Rome further than ever before. From this point, Rome can move into two broad futures. Augustus lived to 75 in our timeline. If he lives to something similar here, Caesar and Augustus' rule has now lasted for a combined 65 years. Basically, everyone alive knows little else than Caesarian-dominated Roman politics. More than enough to potentially normalize it, not just for the population, but for the elites too, who now no longer compete to dominate the Republic, they now compete for favors of the Emperor. So, in this first potential future, we have an earlier, more powerful Roman Empire with a more dictatorial title, where not Augustus, but instead Caesar is considered the first Emperor. The other option is that this alternate Augustus, despite defeating his opponents in war, fails to truly placate the elites and normalize his rule. While the conventional, military way to defeat him has failed, there is always another option. Augustus in this timeline is the one getting Caesared, assassinated by disgruntled elites. If this happens, the Republic is now engulfed in chaos, thrown back to late Republican rule. Very possibly, new civil wars could engulf the state as everyone wants to be the next Caesar. Assuming Augustus doesn't yet have a clear heir, Agrippa may be my favorite to come out of this military struggle. To get legitimacy, it is possible generals start supporting members of the Caesarian dynasty to prop up the power. But sadly, the full outcome of this I cannot really predict without knowing who, where and how comes out on top in this struggle. All we know for sure is that Roman power will suffer greatly from such a period of instability. And even if someone manages to win a resulting civil war, the precedent is now set in stone much earlier that the path to ultimate political power is military. And unless the ambitions and abilities of individual generals is curtailed, Rome will likely continue to exhaust itself with internal conflict, much to the benefit of their rivals. For now though, this is the end of the video. Thank you all for watching and consider leaving a like and a comment, as well as subscribing. If you enjoyed this video, click the video on top to watch another in this series. If you've already seen it, I'm sure the bottom one is great too. Once again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.